Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning and we continue with our discussion of key concepts. So, uh, we have been talking about a number of concepts and we also talked about counterculture, action cinema, adventure films, buddy films, etc. So, um, let me start with uh, something that is generally not discussed, but it is ethnicity and race in films uh, and visual culture. So, uh, what is ethnic? or ethnicity. So, it, uh, it is derived from the Greek word ethnikos. Um, by ethnicity generally we mean people or nation and in the uh, more modern sense it is a group of people sharing a cultural heritage. So, that is how we understand the term ethnicity sharing a cultural common cultural heritage. For example, migrants from one nature to another or um, people who have undergone uh, hardships and uh, therefore, we call them you know ethnics, we have terms such as ethnic strife, ethnic struggles, so, yeah, when people migrate from one place to another and face problems in um, adjusting to those new places. Ethnic groups can be divisive uh, perhaps, but uh, they, they are generally united by some sense of injustice or wrongdoing uh, to the group. It is also rooted in class division and alienation from the majority of people. It is again as I have already explained to you, it relates to shared experience and beliefs of a group of people. Generally, we understand it as a group of people who have been wronged historically, uh, things have been not so good for them, there have been there is a sense of injustice, uh, a sense of injustice against that group. Um, ethnicity also depends upon one's religion, language, nationality, culture, tribal affiliations also and culture, customs and tradition. Historically, race and ethnic groups are subjected to um, operation, humiliation, even genocide they are often understood as groups that uh, historically speaking, um, the, they have been dispossessed and disenfranchised. For example, the holocaust in Germany which uh, uh, is now associated with elimination of people who did not fit a particular profile. Um, some of the iconography of ethnic groups or races are for example, the black people. So, they wear dreadlocks and leather jackets. Um, for example, Jews, so they wear star of David, they wear a prayer shawl and a skull cap. For Native Americans, we have totem or pole or a, a painted face, they use tomahawk and feather headdresses. The Arabs, they have their kinds of clothes, you know, loose garments and all and a beard. So, um, Scholars consider these uh, I, uh, these kinds of iconography uh, symbols, iconographic symbols as damaging essentialization and this becomes problematic in order to understand races. So, in cinema we are talking film appreciation and whenever you see a typical you know bearded guy and all the stereotypes attached to it. What are we doing here? We are essentializing a particular race or linguistic group or cultural group. Okay. So, it has it, it has been done in cinema before, it is being done in cinema before, we need to be more sensitive to these things. Um, some of the major films that are associated with ethnicity. Uh, I can give you a very recent example. This is a, a movie directed by Angelina Jolie um, if, uh, in the land of blood and honey. It is a 2012 film and it explores the genocide in Yugoslavia, particularly in the 1990s. 
Um, it also shows horror of wars waged against Bosnia's Muslims by the Serbs in former Yugoslavia. And Jolie shows us death camps, ethnic cleansing and massacre of civilians in graphic detail. Films that tackle the issue of uh, race, and, uh, race and ethnicity, um, I am giving you a, you know, a very uh, common list of films, uh, not common list of names, where race has been foregrounded. So, you had No Man's Land, The Human Stain, Gentleman's Agreement, The Searchers, Dances with Wolves and Schindler's List. I would suggest that you watch uh, some of these films, all of these films in order to understand how race is portrayed. From here, we move on to another concept that is meta and meta cinema. To understand the term meta cinema, we must first understand the concept of meta theatre, because it originates from that. So, you see in film appreciation, um, one of our commitments to, uh, towards you was that we are going to give you an overview of uh, cinematic aesthetics and how also how cinema is uh, uh, related to or associated with other visual arts also. So, let us look at how cinema draws on from certain theatrical concepts. So, meta theatre is a convenient name for the quality um, or a force in a play which challenges theatre's claim to be simply realistic, to be nothing, but a mirror in which we view the action and sufferings of characters like ourselves, suspending our disbelief in their reality. So, that is meta theatre, meta cinema. Um, we have several instances of meta cinema, for example, Fellini's eight and half. We have been discussing uh, Fellini's eight and half. Um, if you have not yet watched the movie, I do recommend that please watch it. Um, it is about a filmmaker who suffers from a director's block. You know, you have writer's block, writers can't write and director's block. Right, uh, a director cannot direct a movie. So, eight and a half is based on Fellini's own experiences. Fellini is a master of meta cinema. Many of his films are um, meta, meta cinematic in uh, its uh, in their aesthetics. For example, La Estrada too. So, please watch these films in order to understand the concept of meta cinema, self referentiality, and other. Method acting is the next term that we are interested in. Um, this term is interesting because method is applauded as well as ridiculed in our cinema. Many a time we feel, oh, this actor is overdoing uh, preparing or preparation for a role. Uh, he's a method actor. Okay, so it is also used dismissively. Many people feel that actors should be more spontaneous, but method acting is actually something else and it raises an actor, a serious actor if you are, his performance or her performance to another level. I um, will quote Orson Welles, the great Orson Welles, uh, who famously said that I am always making fun of the method, but I use a lot of things that are taken from it. The exponent of uh, method acting was a Russian theatre director. Konstantin Stanislavski and uh, therefore, meta theatre, uh, sorry, meth method acting has also come to be associated with uh, the so called Stanislavski system. He has written a number of books and uh, books based on his method, um, some of the popular ones. I am sure some of you are aware of that who are ac actually seriously interested in um, uh, acting. So, an actor prepares. And another work is um, building a character and creating a role. In the US, the Stanislavski system became popular as the method, first popularized by the group theatre in New York City in the 1930s. In the US, the exponent was Lee Strasberg and later on Stella Adler. Now, some of the key principles of method acting, uh, the Stanislavski system or the method as it has become known is that um, actor's main responsibility was to be believed. Stanislavski first employed methods such as emotional memory 
To prepare for a role that involves fear, the actor must remember something frightening and attempt to act the part in the emotional space of that fear they once felt. This was a clear break from previous modes of acting that held that the actor's job was to become the character and leave their own emotions behind. The creation of physical entries into these emotional states believing that the repetition of certain acts and exercises could bridge the gap between life on and off the stage. From Indian example, uh, from our own cinema, I can give you example of um, how uh, the method has been discussed not so overtly. Please understand here, I do not say that the method acting has been discussed, but in this film, but to an extent, Balki's Shamitab, it gives you glimpses if you are aware of these things, method acting and how actors prepare, then you should watch this movie, which is a very um, interesting take on how actors prepare, although I am not giving you as a key example of method acting. Some of the leading practitioners and I am talking about uh, um, examples from international cinema, you have uh, the great Marlon Brando, um, Monty Clift and James Dean, they all came from the um, Lee Strasberg's school of method acting. Uh, the new wave, American new wave, which started in the late 60s and the early 70s. So, actors associated with that movement, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson, Dustin Hoffman and later on even Sean Penn, Mickey Rourke and actresses such as Mariah Streep and Faye Dunaway. Um, we had example of Liv Ullman and also Emma Thompson, so European actors too. Um, from uh, um, other parts of the world, we have we also have actors such as uh, Daniel Day Lewis, who is an Irish actor known for his uh, great performances in My Left Foot, in the name of the father, and more recently, um, There Will Be Blood and Lincoln. Okay, then we also have examples of uh, someone like Adrian Brody, Christian Bale, and the late Heath Ledger, and all these are great practitioners of the method. You may uh, often have come across a term like mise en scene and I have written it here for you mise en scene. Now, what does it refer to? What does mise en scene mean? It is literally putting on stage, it is a French term, so putting on stage. The term originates from the theatre where it designates everything that appears on a stage. For example, sets, colours, lighting, character movement, etc. Mise en scene includes elements of visual style, it is de uh, designed to create the narrative space and help progress the narrative. Mise en scene is concerned with the look of the film, it includes production design that is sets, props and costumes, colour, lighting, etc. Framing that includes position, for example, depth of field, aspect, no, uh, aspect uh, 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 ratio, height and angle of a particular scene. Uh, it also includes actors performances such as his, his casting, his makeup and movements and also sounds that emanates from the scene that is more diegetic. Very often we come across terms like you know this, uh, this director is a master of mise en scene. Okay. For example, it was often said of a director like Douglas Sirk from um, Hollywood and he was known for his melodramatic films and the way he used mise en scene to portray certain kinds of emotions. From here we will go on to certain aspects of editing. Now, uh, let me talk about continuity editing. Traditionally, cinema adopted a non-intrusive approach to film editing as the intention was for the audience to remain entirely unaware of cuts. The industry introduced a series of cinematographic and editing devices in order to achieve this effect. Um, some of the uh, terms associated with takes and editing is um, one such example is establishing shot or re-establishing shot. For example, an opening shot to establish the location and distance between characters and objects 
within a scene. This helps orientate the audience. Typically, it is shot from a distance and it provides the spectators with important visual information. Following the initial um, establishment of this information, the camera typically cuts into the action. Certain points in the scene, uh, the camera may need to return to the original opening position or establishing a new point removed from the action in order to redetermine spatial relations, which is called a re-establishing shot. We have eye level shot. Here the camera is placed at a height that is equivalent to that of the actor's eyes and the action is filmed from this point. We have the refraining shot. When action takes place in a scene, the camera moves and reframes to keep key points to focus central uh, to the uh, key points of focus central to the frame. And then we have the famous eye line matching and many directors um, famously uh, director from Japan, Ozu, he has uh, tried to interrogate or subvert the eye line matching shot. So, eye line matching, what is it? It is when a character looks off screen, the shot that follows reveals the object of his or her attention. We have something like shot and reverse shot. So, to shoot dialogue between two characters, the camera alternates between two points. It is a very commonly used device. Many a time you must have noticed in cinema, you see the back of the head of one character who is um, you know who is listening and you see the face of the character who is speaking. So, it is a shot reverse shot. The first shot frames character A and is typically shot from the character B's point of view or over B's shoulder. This process is reversed with character B shot from character A's perspective. This model continues throughout a scene and is repeated as many times as is necessary. Sometimes in order to uh, be experimental directors also subvert this technique. We also have something called a term that is very important for us to understand 180 degree rule. This is axis of action. For purpose of continuity, it is important when shooting a scene that the cameraman imagines an invisible line cutting through the action. So, this is called 180 degree shot. It is necessary that all shooting takes place on one side of this line as to cross over one, uh, one would get disorientated and uh, we might end up confusing the audience. The camera must always be placed on one specific side of this line. When editing is unobtrusive, the audience is kept unaware of the technicalities involved in creating cinema. When editing does occur, it is typically to lead the viewer to certain conclusions. This approach has become quite common and has been traditionally put into practice. Um, one of the uh, most uh, or rather more radical inventions in editing um, was montage and montage is associated with the theory of social or so, sorry Soviet realism or even social realism you can call it. So, uh, um, what is a montage? So, montage is a kind of editing technique and it refers to a series of images and sounds that form a visual pattern. There may not be any clear logical or sequential pattern here. Montage editing came out of the Soviet experimental cinema of the 1920s. It was first thought of by Lev Kuleshov but it is primarily associated with Sergei Eisenstein, who articulated the theories of montage and typage. He used non-professionals with clear physical traits in representative roles. Montage at the ideological level suggests conflict and collision. It is particularly used when an editor or filmmaker want to convey a great deal into a brief segment. Eisenstein believed that collision and conflict must be inherent to all visual signs in film. Juxtaposing shots make them collide or conflict and meaning is produced through this. Montage is a rapid alteration between sets of shots. For example, the training sequence in Rocky, um, it includes collision and conflict between people and situations. For example, the Odessa steps massacre in Battleship Potemkin where Eisenstein's uh, editing style privileges the proletariat over narrative and characterization. Some of the great montages include Battleship Potemkin, 
citizen king, the dining table scene, the baptism scene in the godfather, the training sequence in uh, Rocky and the kissing montage in Cinema Paradiso which is an Italian film which was released in 1988. Another concept is or rather it is a genre rather um, musicals, the musicals and many of us are big admirers of the musical genre. So, the first all singing musical was the Broadway melody, it was released in it was made in 1929. The tradition continued uh, throughout especially and it reached its peak with singing in the rain 1952, it's a Stanley Donen film, Top Hat and Carefree. Now, MGM was one of the studios most commonly associated with this genre and RKO another great studio uh, in Hollywood, it also fostered one of the most popular musical pairings Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, they were a um, dancing pair singing dancing stars. Song and dance driven films are not uncommon in India, we know that and uh, some of the most well known examples of uh, I am talking about an out and out song and dance film, um, uh, one is Kalpana and another is Vishantaram's Janak Janak Payal Vajay. One of the functions of the music was to resolve conflicts in a society and encourage some so sort of social harmony and stability. Now, uh, we have uh, an example of uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and also Oklahoma, where conflicts are resolved Mm, through music. The musicals of the 60s included several Elvis Presley films and also those starring the Beatles for instance, Hard Day's Night. Um, we had another uh, uh, perfect example of musicals, West Side Story, which is a rare example where a musical ends in a tragedy. The musical is a dying genre in Hollywood, especially in West, but uh, uh, till 60s and some uh, parts of uh, the 70s, it is still the this genre still continued. Of course, we have an exception like Mamma Mia, which was released very recently. So, later examples of successful music musicals include My Fair Lady, which was based on Shaw's Pygmalion, Nashville, uh, a Robert Altman film, which is more like a political social commentary done through music and then uh, of course, John Travolta's Starrer's star Saturday Night Fever and also Grease. By the early 70s, there was a decline in the musicals and a film soundtrack was sourced from pre-existing albums. Musicals however, are a very popular genre in India and many of our films can be termed as romantic musicals or musical romances. For instance, you have Hum Aapke Hai Kaun and Dil Wale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge. Let us move on to talk about another concept or genre with which is mythological. Now, mythological the term is my myth here and a myth is a traditional story about heroes or supernatural beings often explaining the origins of a natural phenomenon or aspects of human behavior. This is called a myth. Now, most Hollywood mythological films are based on Greek Roman mythology. The very first Indian film to be made uh, is Raja, uh, sa, sorry, Dada Saheb Falke's mythological film called Raja Harishchandra in 1913. The plot was selected to capture the interest of a large populace. Generally, episodes are taken uh, in our situation at least from epics and scriptures such as Ramayana and Mahabharata. They depict the actions of gods, demons, superhuman powers. Um, once upon a time, the female role in these movies, they were played by male actors. Though in India, we no longer have mainstream mythologicals, we do have very popular television serials um, on our Indian TV. Queer cinema is another concept that you should know a term and uh, especially who are interested in uh, gender studies. So, the term new queer cinema was coined by B. Ruby Rich in several publications including the British 
film journal Sight and Sound as well as the New York weekly The Village Voice to describe the appearance of certain films at Sundance Film Festivals in the early 1990s that evinced a politicized stance towards queer culture. Queer cinema is often comprised of as independent films made on a small budget and often financed by foundation and arts council grants and the movement new queer cinema itself can be seen as the culmination of several developments in American cinema and American culture. Most filmmakers making queer cin uh, films uh, uh, they self identify as queers and their films showcase a post stonewall openness to question of gay politics and identity. Some major queer fil filmmakers are Derek Yorman who made Sebastian and Caravaggio, uh, also The Garden and Edward II. You have Gus Vincent who made Malanoche, My Own Private Idaho, even Cowgirls Get the Blues and Milk. We have Todd Haynes who made Poison, Safe, Velvet Goldmine, Far From Heaven, I Am Not There. And in India we have someone like Honor who has made I Am and My Brother Nikhil. From here we move on to spoof films. Many of us really do enjoy spoofs and spoof films are defined as an imitative work created to mock, comment on or trivialize an original work, its subject or author style or some other target by means of satiric or ironic Im imitation. For example, if you watch the opening shot, a uh, very celebrated opening shot of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Odyssey and then you see what um, Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson have done to it in the Zoolander. Okay, so, I would suggest you watch it and perhaps you will understand what exactly I mean. In the 1930s, Hollywood made a series of classical horror films like Dracula and Frankenstein. For a while, audiences took these films seriously and they were scared by them. But uh, now, of course, we have uh, um, spoof films, horror spoof films where um, the idea is to mock or ridicule all the traits of these films, of these horror films. We also have spoofs like John English starring Rowan Atkinson which is a spoof of um, all these uh, films such uh, James Bond films particularly. I uh, will take you to a key technical concept uh, now which is called suture. The suture refers, what is suture after all suture is like weaving in or stitching. So, what, what is being stitched here? Suture refers to the thematic, visual and editing technique employed by the director or cinematographer to make us forget that the camera is the one doing the looking. Okay, it is not the camera, we are made to feel one with the screen. Okay, so, think of all those editing techniques that we have been talking about, continuity editing, eye line matching, 180 degree shot etcetera. You know that film is diegetic in nature that is the characters occupy their own world within which they interact and perform various activities. Camera and editing techniques show us how what to look at and how to view the movie. The last concept that I am going to discuss for today's class is voiceover. All of us must have, uh, must be familiar with what is voiceover. We often come across this, uh, particularly in advertisements. So it is a production technique where a voice that is not part of the narrative is used. The voiceover may be spoken by someone who appears elsewhere in the production or by a specialist voice actor. Voiceover technique is used to give voices and personalities to animated characters. For example, in Herman Melville's uh, Moby Dick, which is a 1956 movie directed by John Huston, you have the character of Ishmael who narrates the story and sometimes comments on the action in voiceover. Uh, we have the example of uh, William Holden's character in Sunset Boulevard and uh, uh, again in uh, The Counterfeit Traitor, where they narrate their story through the character. So, that is all for today. Thank you very much and we will meet for our next class.